We're going to be in Psalm 1 this morning. If you've ever traveled around the world, um, or around the United States, or <laughs> even throughout the state of South Carolina, when you go to different places, entrances tend to tell you something about the place that you're going into. Uh, some of them are um, not very grand, I guess you could say. They are low-key, if you will. Some places you go, they have a grand entrance, and it's kind of keying you in to what you're going to find beyond that or behind that. Think about uh, some of the different entrances that you've seen around the world. You've got the St. Louis Arch. You've got uh, the Louvre. Let me show you some pictures here. Here's the St. Louis Arch. It's actually called the Gateway Arch. And the uh, other side of the Mississippi River, and here it is. This is supposed to be a monument to all those who went out west. And if it is a gateway to the west, it is grand. It is splendid as you go out that way. This is the entrance to the city of Petra in Jordan. They took all this time in this little gorge here to carve this out, and there is a city on the other side of that. It is this grand entrance. It's meant to convey what they want you to think as you go into the city. Uh, this is the Louvre. The Louvre actually has three different entrances. You've got this glass pyramid here. As you go in there, it's supposed to be beautiful. And I, on the other side of that, you do have some of the greatest pieces of art and some of the greatest artifacts in the world. Now, you've got this one as well. This, these are the gates of Argonoth. Uh, here's your uh, bi-yearly Lord of the Rings reference. This is not a real place, by the way, all right? This is a figment of someone's imagination, but it's meant to convey the grandeur that goes on behind that. When you look at something as grand and as big as the Psalms, which we're about to start looking at here today, you would think that your entrance is going to be very similar. It's going to be grand and it's going to be big, and I believe that it is. Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, in particular, give you a feel for the entire book. There, if you look at Psalm 1, there are some people who say that it's like the preface to the book. It's kind of setting the stage, and you're going to see the wicked and the righteous, two of the main groups that you meet throughout the book of Psalms. Now, don't worry, we're not going to go through the entire book of Psalms. I guess we could. It would take us probably three or four years to do so. What we're going to do here this summer is we're going to take seven or eight psalms, beginning with Psalm 1, and then Psalm 2 next week, and then going from there, and we're going to look at these different types of psalms that give us an idea or a representation of the book. We're going to look at psalms of praise, psalms of depression, psalms of confession, worship, pleas for help. We're going to look at an imprecatory psalm, where... You have someone praying judgment on their enemies, and what does that mean for us? Is that something that we can do? We're going to look at psalms where someone has been betrayed and the range of human emotions that you see throughout that. But today we're going to start here in Psalm 1. And Psalm 1 is the entrance to everything. And in Psalm 1, you meet two groups of people. You meet the righteous or the godly, and then you meet the wicked. I want you to see if you can see the contrast here. There are three contrasts that we see in this passage. I want you to see if you can see those as we read this. Psalm 1 verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Lord, we ask now that you would speak to us through your word. Would you fill me with your spirit, protect me from my flesh, and Lord, I pray that even as we are in the Old Testament here, and even as we're in the Psalms, that the glory of Christ would come through, and that we would see that His righteousness is what we ultimately need. Lord, would you minister to my brothers and sisters and friends here? 
Lord, give them what they need most today. And Holy Spirit, we trust that you're able to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name and for His glory. Amen. A big thought that you can take home and chew on from this is this. The greatest blessing is to be counted among the righteous. There is really no greater blessing that you can have in this world than to be counted as a righteous person. And this is one of the things that we're going to see in this. What what it looks like to be righteous. This isn't a handbook. It's not very detailed. But it gives us some characteristics of a righteous person. And we're going to ask the question at the end, how does this become true of us? How can this be true of us? The contrast that we have here between the wicked and the righteous. And this is the way this breaks down. As you look at these contrasts, we see, first of all, that the wicked and the righteous, they have different values from each other. Look at verse 1. Blessed is the man... So here's your righteous man. We're going to see him show up throughout this. And by the way, this isn't just a man. The word could be translated person. So bless is the person who, and this is going to be negative. This is what they don't do. They don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. They don't stand in the way of sinners. They don't sit in the seat of scoffers. But they do, in the positive, delight in the law of the Lord. And they meditate, or he meditates, on the Lord's law day and night. It's interesting that Psalms begins with this word, blessed. It's the very same way that Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed is this, or blessed are you, when this is true of you. Jesus begins His sermon this way, and blessed there, and in a very similar way here, it means happy, full of joy, full of peace, full of life. When we think of blessing, a lot of times we think of the material, but it goes so much deeper than that. The man who walks in this way, the woman who walks in this way is going to have something so much greater than something material, something that doesn't last, something that can be broken, something that can be burned, something that could be taken away from you. So a person who doesn't follow the wicked is blessed. Well, what does that mean? Well, we see is is the psalmist here, and we don't know that this one was written by David, um, the, the, first, the, the majority of the ones in Psalms 1 through 41 are written by David. We don't know that this one is written by him, so we'll just say that it's the psalmist. The psalmist tells us, first of all, that the wicked make their own rules. Now, there are three things here. He talks about walking and standing and sitting, and there are some people who think that these are different stages of, of wickedness. That's definitely possible. But we see as this begins to break down, we see, first of all, that they are walking. That there are the wicked who walk. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. This word walking has the idea of walking in step with, in line with. You know, I think of a marching band and how the music plays and the time is played and everyone who is part of that, they keep time with it and they do the same thing and they move the same way and they move the same direction. This is a picture of what the majority of those who are without Christ, the majority of the world, the way that they think and the way that they act, the wicked, the way of the wicked, the way that the wicked march today, if you will, is that everything is wrapped up in now. The pleasure of now, the importance of self, the gaining of things. You know, as I uh, work with college students... One of the things I bring up occasionally is I ask them this question. Why are you going to college? Why are you going to college? And um, to get a degree, all right, why do you want a degree? And then you Usually by the time you drill down, the majority of them is, uh, the reason is, so I can get a good job and earn lots of money. And not all of them, but that is, that is, That is part of it. And we need to have jobs and we need to earn money. There is nothing wrong with that. But that is a thinking that infiltrates even our minds as Christians. What is it that drives our thinking? Many times, unintentionally, without us knowing it, it is the the thinking of the wicked. It is the counsel of the wicked. It is the reasoning of the wicked. Why should we go to college? Ultimately, we should go to college to to prepare ourselves to fulfill whatever God has made us to do and to find our place to live for His glory and to do things well for His glory, to be good at it 
so that we can be a credit and honor to His name and then also to provide for our families. And if material things come from that, that's fine, but that shouldn't be our driving factor. This, this is just an example of how the thinking of the world can creep into our minds. <laughs> Another one is uh, YOLO. You only live once. And it's as if everything that we do here, that we need to enjoy every aspect in every moment of this life to the fullest because this is all that there is. And that just absolutely is not true. We're inundated, inundated with the counsel of the wicked. It's always been that way, and it's that way now. If you are on social media at all, or watch TV at all now, with it being the month of June, we are now inundated over and over again with the message that your morality and who you love and who you sleep with doesn't matter. Over and over and over again. And that's not something that we should get angry and nasty about. It's something that should grieve us and, and should point our hearts to, to or point us to taking the gospel in, in gracious love to all of our neighbors, whoever they are, wherever they are, however they live. But it is something that should grieve us and is also something that should make us realize that this thinking is all around us. So the, there are those who walk in the way with sinners. They march in line with sinners. They walk in line with the sinners. Then he says that blessed is the man who doesn't stand in the way of sinners. Now, this word stand has the idea this could be progressing here from not just walking with, but standing means I've made up my mind. I'm firm, I'm, pat, uh, I'm standing pat in this, I'm standing with them, I'm casting my lot. But at the very least, you are stopping and you are listening to and you are in the way of sinners. Then the last thing that he says is, Blessed is the man who doesn't sit in the seat of the scorner, sit in the seat of the scoffer. We've definitely progressed here. This idea of sitting, especially in the Old Testament, and in the Scripture has the idea of, my mind is made up, I've sat down, this is where I am at. And it's not just that you're walking in line with thinking that's not in line with God, or that you're standing in the way of sinners, but now you've moved to scoffing and deriding and making fun of the things of God. And this is a progression that maybe you've seen, I know that I've seen. I can think of a young person that I worked with in college, and I began to see them to, to see them take these steps. First of all, just walking in this way, in the counsel of the ungodly. And then the next thing, I know they are standing there, and they've declared themselves and aligned with the ungodly. And now it's to the point, as is, is I see things that they post, it is outright derision and scorn of the things of God. And ultimately, the author of the Psalms here is telling us that is not going to bring blessing. That's not going to bring peace. That is not going to bring joy into your life. So what is the contrast of that? The, the wicked are making their own rules here. They're not subject to God in any way. They want to do their own thing. Well, on the opposite, opposite side of this, you see what the godly do. The godly delight in God's instruction. Look at how he says it, verse 2, but the delight, or his delight, is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he meditates day and night. See, the law is all that David had. He had the first five books of the Bible, and there were possibly some of the prophets that had uh, written by this point, but by and large, he had the law of God. We have the full picture now. We've got the law, we've got the Psalms, we've got the prophets, we've got the wisdom literature, we've got the New Testament, we've got the Gospels. We've got the epistles. Uh, we have the, the prophetic books of the, Old Test the New Testament. We have all of these things, and we have such a huge, uh, huge catalog, if you will, of things that we can delight in and that we can direct our minds to. And the question that comes up in this is we think about what we think about. As a righteous person, if you are saved, is God's Word a delight to us? This is God's revealed instructions and truth. Do we value what God values? Well, how can that happen? Well, 
The psalmist here says that one of the ways that happens is by meditating day and night. This word meditate doesn't necessarily have the idea of just silently thinking about. It actually has the idea of kind of speaking to yourself. It's almost like you're, you're riding down the road and you're, you're saying these truths to yourself. But it's even beyond that. It's delighting in it. it it's... it's um, it's making it personal. It's bringing it into your heart. It's engrafting it into your heart. It's mulling it over and over. It's getting every single good thing out of it that you can. You know, we see this in uh, different ways. Um, y'all know that I like to make uh, Carolina caviar, full of peanuts. And uh, I'm, I'm probably the only person who does this. But I like to eat the peanuts and then take the shells and then eat the shells and get the get the brine out of the shells. you got to get every good drop out of it. And that's just a very small picture of what it's like to meditate and delight in God's Word. Drawing the lines between Scriptures. It's not just that we are thinking about the Scriptures. We're thinking how this fits in with this. Now, look, I'm going to be honest with you. And, and, And I... I experienced this as well. Uh, everything, because of the technology that's around us, everything because of that technology has shortened our attention spans and made it harder and harder for us to think long and deep. I experienced it in my own life. It, it, if you were to sit down, most of us, a lot of us, maybe not most of us, but a lot of us, if we were to sit down and say, I'm going to put all this technology aside for an hour and just sit here and think about God's Word. That literally sounds like the most boring thing that could happen to you in your life. Some of us would start to break out in sweats about halfway through. It is, it is hard for us. And somebody might say, I, I, I just can't do it. My mind wanders. I have a hard time pulling all of this together. I have a hard time thinking that way. Well, we can. It's like reading a good book and getting to the end of the book and needing to remember what happened at the beginning of the book and tying all those loose ends together and maybe even more appropriate and applicable today. Some of you older people need to tune out here for just a moment. It's like what my kids do with Marvel movies, okay? There was a, a series that came out last year, or this year, called WandaVision, and it was nine or ten episodes. And what you do when you watch that is they have all these little hidden things in there that give you background on all the other Marvel characters. And my kids, God bless them, they would sit there and watch it, and they would be thinking about every single Marvel movie they'd seen and how this might connect with it and how it might work together, or it's the way some of you do with Star Wars, to be honest with you. You go back and forth and you watch it, you're diving deep, trying to find how everything ties together. That is, in a very simple way, a picture of how we should be thinking about God's Word, delighting in it. We are capable of this, but we are often dazzled by things other than the instruction and truth that we can gain from God's Word. And I have to ask, in a very blunt way, what would it mean to us spiritually if we put as much effort into God's Word as we put into tying up all these loose ends from other things that we read and watch and consume and think about? Before we move on to the next contrast here, I think it's important for us to just think about this. A lot of believers are intent and not walking in the way of the wicked or sitting in the seat of the scornful. They don't want to do that negative. But on the other side, they also don't do the positive. It's not enough to just avoid the way of the wicked. We want to be people who also delight in the truth and in the instruction that God gives us. The wicked and the righteous, we see here they have different values. We also see that they have different fruitfulness. Different fruitfulness. Different ways that they produce fruit. Look at verses 3 and 4. He, the righteous man, is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff 
that the wind drives away. When you look at the righteous here, we see that the godly, first of all, bear fruit. Look at how he's described. It is a tree that is planted. Now, this never clicked with me till this week. Maybe I'm looking into this a little too deeply. This is an intentional planting of a tree. This isn't some wild, random tree. This is a tree that is planted and cultivated and cared for. In this very dry culture, they would plant them near streams, and sometimes they would even put irrigation ditches that water would flow through in between their trees so that the trees could could, uh, soak up that water and grow strong. But all of this is intentional. And this intentionality isn't you. This is God who has planted you. This is God who has given you everything that you need. Think of 2 Peter chapter 1. He has given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And in there, he talks about he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And as we looked last week in Romans chapter 8 about the truth of us having the indwelling Spirit in us, the law of the Spirit, we have to realize that the righteous person is now indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And we have everything that is needed to be a strong, growing, thriving, fruit-producing tree with deep roots. We have all of God's Word. We have the Holy Spirit. We've got more resources now than we could ever imagine in the past. You look at this person. It produces fruit, not just pretty leaves. You know, I think of the Pharisees in the New Testament. You remember when we were going through Mark and Mark 12, how Jesus went and He cursed the fig tree? He'd gone up to the fig tree, and what was it that He wanted? He reached up in His branches because it had leaves, and it looked like it should have what? It looked like it should have figs. It looked like it should have fruit, but it didn't. And we saw that that was likely a picture of Israel, or at least the religious leadership of Israel that had all the bells and whistles and looked like they had it all together, but they didn't have any fruit. And this tree is a tree that brings forth its fruit in its season. I also can't help but think of John 15 where Jesus talks about us abiding in Him. And that when we abide in Him, He does what? Or causes us to do what? To bring forth much fruit. Fruit. I think of Galatians 5 where it talks about walking in the Spirit. As we walk in the Spirit, the Spirit produces His fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, all of those things, meekness, gentleness. Those things are things that are produced in our life by God. The righteous person, the genuinely righteous person, will bear fruit. It also says, in a sense, that his leaf doesn't wither in drought. Look at how it says, his leaf does not wither. Everything that he needs is there for him spiritually. And he says everything that he does, he prospers. When we think of prospering here, we have to take the long view because when you look at the world around us today, It doesn't always look like it's the righteous who are prospering. It doesn't look like it's the righteous who have everything. But when you take the long view, especially as we look at the end of the wicked here, we have to understand that what we are doing now ultimately matters for eternity. And yes, we have impact in this life now, and we see that sometimes, but ultimately it is God who prospers us and helps us to have an eternal impact. There's also, we see it on this earth, there there are men and women who, who as they walk in the Spirit, they walk in excellence, and they do rise, not not as some uh, payback for being good, but they do rise in excellence to the top of their field. They do tackle things and do them well. They do solve problems. They do bring glory to God's name in that way, and God prospers them in that way. So it's the righteous here, the godly, they bear good fruit. The psalmist gives us a very stark contrast. Very stark contrast with the wicked. The wicked have no purpose. The righteous bear fruit, 
It is a fruit that we know from the Scripture that lasts eternally. By the way, one thing I forgot to say about the fruit is the fruit is for the benefit of others, not for ourselves. So as we bear fruit, it is ministering to others. It is helping others. That is part of our purpose as believers. The wicked aren't that way. They have no purpose. Look at how they're described. The wicked are not so, verse 4. They are like chaff that the wind drives away. Chaff, I want you to think of wheat straw. If you've ever planted grass and you take uh, wheat straw and you put it out and you shake it around, you got some of that straw that's heavy, right? And it falls on the ground, but you've got some of it that's small. And what does it do? It just blows away. Well, that's what chaff is. They would grow wheat, they would grow different grains, and as they would take the head of that wheat and they would begin to sift it, it would separate the wheat from the husk that was around it. And they would literally take it and they would throw it in the air, and what would happen to the wheat or to the grain? It would fall back on the screen or on the blanket, and as it went up in the air, the wind would drive the chaff away. That chaff has no purpose whatsoever. It doesn't benefit anyone. It brings no satisfaction. It serves no purpose. Spurgeon was talking about this. He says that the chaff and the wheat are near each other. They're close to each other, but they're ultimately separated at the harvest. This is what a very similar picture to what Jesus drew when he talked about the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the and the weeds, the grain and the weeds, how they grow together in the same place and they even look very similar, but it's at the judgment that the useless, the, the non-fruit bearing is taken out. He actually says that it's burned. The chaff is useless and it's blown into oblivion. And I know other, no other way to say it, and I say this as graciously as I can, but the wicked, those who are in their sins, all they do is what is in this life now, and nothing that they do matters for eternity. There is nothing that they do that ultimately has any lasting purpose. And God says that the wicked... Those who aren't righteous are like chaff that's driven away with no meaning. So the godly bear fruit, the wicked have no purpose. And then the psalmist gives us our final contrast here. They have different ends, or you could say different eternities. Look at verses 5 and 6. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This contrast isn't just in life, which is what we've been looking at in the first little bit here, more than anything else. This contrast continues to death, or should I say, after death. What is the end of each one of these? Well, the wicked, we see, are excluded and punished. The wicked will not stand in the judgment. Sinners will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. They're not going to survive. There's no leg to stand on. While they stood in their own counsel against God in opposition to God, now they fall before God, the very God that they rejected. There's nothing that they've done that commend them to God. He also says that they won't be in the congregation or the assembly of the righteous. One person said this, there are no sinners in heaven. And that is a source of great comfort. There are redeemed sinners in heaven. I want to make sure that we know that. But there is actually no sinners in heaven because by that point we have all been redeemed and in heaven our sin natures have been obliterated and done away with. And that should bring us great comfort. That in heaven there are no sinners and there is no sin because it is sin that brings the curse. It is sin that causes so much heartache and despair and trial in this word. Someone actually put it this way, heaven would be hell for the unregenerate sinner because they wouldn't be able to enjoy it and experience the way that heaven is meant to be enjoyed and experienced. There are those who seem to have it all on this earth, 
but they are excluded from an eternity with a loving, righteous God. Again, someone said that this is the way the wicked are. Their stories are written in the sand before the tide comes in, forever useless and forever forgotten. Also, that they can live with the pleasure of life now, not rightly related to their God in any way. So the wicked we see in this are excluded and they perish. That's what he says at the end of verse 6, the way of the wicked will perish. Well, what of the righteous? What is this final contrast for them? The righteous ultimately are known by God. Verse 6, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Knows the way can be translated, they are known by the Lord. You could put it this way, as we've looked at this, they are planted for eternity. They are known by their God. They are loved by their God. Now, I look at a passage like this, and I think, how? I look at a passage like this, and I see this listing of what the righteous do, and I know that I fall so short of that. I mean, almost daily. And if this is what is required to be blessed by God, then the question that runs through my mind sometimes is, do I have any hope of this? This doesn't always describe me. Who can really stand with confidence? How can we actually know that we're in the congregation or the assembly of the righteous? Well, the good news is you can't. You can't ultimately fulfill Psalm 1. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, but the question is, why are we trying to fulfill Psalm 1? Are we trying to fulfill Psalm 1 to get God's favor? Or are we fulfilling Psalm 1 because of God's blessing and favor that He's already given us? See, I believe that the Psalm 1 man isn't you, it's not me, it's ultimately Jesus Christ. The Psalm 1 man is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. That is Jesus in every way. He never once walked in the counsel of the wicked. He never once stood in the way of the wicked. He never once sat in the seat of the scornful. He had nothing but fruitfulness that came from his life. This paints a picture of Jesus. He is everything that we should be but can't be. And the great news is, because He's everything that we should be but that we can't be, He, in His grace and in His love, gives us His righteousness. Do you want righteousness ascribed to you? Do you want righteousness given to you? Well, I think of what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He was made to be sin who knew no sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. When we put our faith in Jesus, He gives us His goodness. He gives us His righteousness. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.30. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.30, Paul is speaking of the work of Jesus. And this is what he says, Because of Him, because of Jesus, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, became to us righteousness, became to us sanctification, became to us redemption, so that as it is written, let no one who boasts... Let all who boast, boast in the Lord. You know, I see this here. And I realize that Jesus, for us, gives us everything that we need to be blessed in God. He gives us that goodness, that righteous, that we can be safe in the assembly of the righteous. Now, The temptation for something like this, and I'll tell you, for a long time in my life, probably the majority of my life, I would read a psalm like this, and without knowing it, I would drift into 
a, a type of moralism. Let me do these good things. Let me strive for this standard so that I can be the blessing of God. I remember one teacher that I had throughout my teens. Um, he made a huge emphasis on memorizing and meditating on Scripture. And looking back on it now, it was really a prosperity gospel type thing. You do this so that God blesses you. It was all about us fulfilling some standards so that we could get blessing from God. And it, it actually became a very legalistic thing. All these things that you meditate on so that you can be blessed. He'd take you to Joshua 1.8 and, and Joshua 1. Nobody will be able to stand before you. You're going to be a world changer, a world conqueror if you, um, if you meditate on God's Word. We'll tell that to Stephen. Uh, tell that to others who didn't conquer the world as they just simply walked faithfully with the Lord. The temptation is to make this a type of moralism. We don't want to walk away from Psalm 1 trying to be gooder, if you will. We don't follow Psalm 1 to get blessing. We follow it because we already are blessed and righteous in the work of Jesus Christ. So this should change the way that we approach a psalm like this. When we are secure in Christ, when we are righteous in Him, then the Spirit can stir in us a desire to be this person. The Spirit can give us the grace to be this person. The Spirit can give us these marks to be the Psalm 1 person. And it's not to gain any favor with God. It's because we already have favor with God. And we are able to delight because we see that He is good and we see that what He has done is good for us. It's not that we sit back here and say, well, Jesus did it for me, I'm good. It's that we want to be what God's Word tells us to be. Except now we've got a new engine to help us accomplish it. We've got a new nature that helps us live Psalm 1. So when you walk away from this today, first question should be, am I in the congregation of the righteous? And you're not in the congregation of the righteous because of anything that you do. You're not in the congregation of the righteous because you come to church, because you've been baptized, because you give money, because you try to live a moral life, that does not place you in the congregation of the righteous. <laughs> the Psalms themselves say, and then Romans 3 later on says, that the righteous things we try to do, they're like filthy rags before God. It's not what places you in the congregation of the righteous. It's your trust in a righteous God who has made a way for you. That's what places you in the congregation of the righteous. And so if you've never personally trusted Jesus, if you've been trying to earn God's favor, you read Psalm 1 and you're like, yes, I'm going to live by this. This is the mark that I'm going to live by. If you try to do that, I'm telling you, that is going to, lead, that is going to ultimately lead to you still separated from God, still in your sin, and ultimately not righteous. So you can, because of God's gift to you, lay aside your, self, your efforts to earn it and just embrace the goodness and righteousness of Jesus who earned it for you. Believe that He died, that He was buried, that He rose again. Confess that He is Lord Believe in your heart that He is Lord. Repent and turn from walking in the way of the wicked or walking in the counsel of the ungodly, standing with the wicked, sitting in the seat of the scornful. Repent, uh, repent of those things and turn in full faith to Christ. And then you can be blessed. And then you can begin to actually, by God's power, be the Psalm 1 person. 
And if you're a believer, I think the question is this. Thank God that you are blessed in Christ and then ask, have I just taken that blessing and just stayed neutral with it? Or am I someone who because of that blessing actually delights in what God has done, delights in God's truth, meditates in God's truth? When my life is looked at spiritually, is it characterized as a tree that's planted by the water that's bringing forth its fruit in its season? Because God has given you everything that you need for that. And I'm going to be honest with you. It is even possible for us as righteous people to fall into a pattern of walking with sinners. Not that we aren't with sinners, but walking in their thinking standing in their thinking. And the antidote to that is delighting in God's law, delighting in God's truth, having our minds renewed so that we line up with and exemplify by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the ultimate Psalms 1 man. If you don't mind, heads bowed, eyes closed. I said that we don't need to walk away from this psalm with moralism thinking that we can do in order to gain favor. Maybe that describes your life. And you have thought that you could somehow or another be good with God by what you do. I would would urge you, I would beg you, to put that thinking aside, to repent of that thinking, to change your mind about that thinking and see that it is only Jesus who can give you righteousness. It is only Jesus who can make you good with God. I would love to talk with you after our gathering here. I'll be in the back. You can touch base with me this week, but don't let this sit here. I want to take the Scripture and show you the good gift of God and how that can be yours as well. Believers, as I usually do at this time, I'm going to be silent here for just a moment. And if the Lord has spoken to you in any way, would you speak back to Him? Thank Him for the blessing of righteousness. Thank Him for His help in this. Maybe you were challenged in your thinking that delighting in God's truth and instruction is something that ought to be part of your life. Whatever it is, I'm going to be silent and allow you to talk with God as He has talked with you.